Hello, everyone. How would you like to buy some life-saving pharmaceutical products made in this high-end pharmaceutical plant, where you probably don't even want to have a sandwich, using the world's latest manufacturing techniques, um, which result in lots and lots of pills that look really good, but actually contain nothing but pretty bad stuff. So here's an example on the screen that shows a cement mixer that's used to mix your uh, pharmaceutical ingredients. Um, and the folks in the picture are actually the government inspectors that discovered this lab and not the counterfeiters. I'll be surprised if they have dressed this nicely and work in an environment that doesn't look so sanitary. Um, what do you typically find in a counterfeit drug? You th they find things uh, from uh, cornstarch to chalk, uh, which are relatively harmless, uh, until you start looking at heavy metals, uh, bones, uh, pieces of animals, um, rat poison we've seen in, in some cases, or uh, chemicals found in antifreeze, which I don't think you should actually buy and use to treat any disease. So by and large, counterfeit medications, people tend to think of them as placebos, but they're actually quite harmful and people have died due to the consumption of these fake drugs. So what's the impact? The World Customs Organization estimates that it's about $200 billion of these fake pharmaceutical products being sold every year. Someone's making a lot of money. But in this age of bailouts, who really knows how much $200 billion is worth, right? It could be a stack of money, somebody prints it out, somebody borrows it, never returns it, who knows, right? So let's look at some, <laughs> some lives, because that's something we can count. Everybody has one. Not everybody has $200 billion or a stash of billion somewhere. And so, Due to fake tuberculosis and malaria drugs alone, over 700,000 people die every year. And that's equivalent to four fully packed jumbo jets crashing every day. Now, that would make the headlines if it were that obvious, but people take these pills and you're ill anyways and something happens and you don't really get better. You don't really attribute that to counterfeit meds. Could be the doctor screwed up, could be some incurable disease, could be aliens, who knows, right? So counterfeit drugs, kill people and it's hard to detect. But these studies show that there's quite an impact and it's a global impact because these fake drugs do not need visas to cross boundaries and reach our pharmacies. So take a look again at the high-end manufacturing plants where some of these pills are made and uh, tell me if you can determine which one came from that factory. Anyone, is there one on the left, on the right? Well, you're pretty smart not to bet. I used to try to bet on these things and sort of try to figure out as an expert and I, I sort of really discovered it was a bad idea because as you can see, they look pretty much identical. One is genuine made in a high-end uh, pharmaceutical plant. The other one's made in someone's kitchen or warehouse or garage or something. But because they don't have to spend much money on the production site, they can spend all the money on the packaging. And when you go take your drug, it's the packaging that counts, right? It looks really cool, shiny, it has a hologram on it, so you buy the one that looks shiny, and then you end up being duped, right? So in this case, you can see it's very tough for a consumer who walks into a pharmacy to tell the difference between a genuine product and then a fake product. How do these fake products end up on the pharmacy shelves anyways? Right? When you think of the pharmaceutical supply chain, you typically think of this straight line uh, distribution chain where the manufacturer will make the product, it'll go to a happy independent wholesaler, they'll stick a smiley face or something and ship it onto a distributor, puts it on an airplane, it flies over somewhere, retailer gets a hold of it, puts a nice price tag on it, insurance pays for it, and you consume the product. However, the real pharmaceutical supply chain looks a bit more like this. The pharmaceutical manufacturer makes a product, it goes out there, the distributor doesn't like it, gets returned, there's some payment issues, and then the products disappear, they get lost, and then the patients get the product, they say, oh, this is fake, I don't want it anymore, resell it to a pharmacy or a hospital that has a stock out. It's quite a mess. And this is only the genuine pharmaceutical supply chain. So if you toss in a couple of counterfeiters and mega counterfeiters who make active ingredients that are fake, that are going to real pharmaceutical companies, it really looks like quite a mess, right? You don't want to be studying this, this supply chain. Uh, some studies have shown that up to 30 different companies can touch a product before it ends up on the pharmacy shelf. So it's quite a mess. You don't want to be involved in this. And if you're the consumer, you're at the receiving end. So we need something to solve this problem. 
And the way we've decided to do it is to influence demand so that we can impact supply. People wouldn't make things that people don't buy. Right? It doesn't make sense. Why would you do it? And so let's figure out how to empower the patients so they can make a determination and only buy the things that they actually want to buy and not get tricked into buying drugs that they don't want to buy. So if you're trying to solve, solve the labyrinth, there's actually no way to get to the other end if you're still staring at it there. Um, <laughs> so don't get confused if you're sort of tracing around and, and, and there is, there is no, no way to get to the patient. Uh, but effectively, what we're saying is we're going to empower patients with technology that they carry in your pockets every day so they can avoid playing Russian roulette with your health and be able to find the right drugs at the right time in, a, in an easy and, and free way. And so we'll be able to build a business around it. We put scratch labels on the pharmaceutical products. At the point of purchase, the consumer would take out their cell phone, scratch the panel, they'll see a number of texts and get, get a response saying genuine or fake. Right, it's very simple. And all of these markets overseas where counterfeiting is, is more of a problem than, than it is here in the US, the drugs aren't in the aisle. So you walk up to a counter and you say, I'd like to buy drug X, and then you pull it off the shelf, and you could scratch and text and you say, here's my money, I'm gonna buy it, but I wanna check. And then you get a response and then you go off. If it's fake, you call it in, and then authorities come and actually do investigations and shut down pharmacies. And we've seen this happen uh, in West Africa, thanks to vigilance consumers. What does it look like? Uh, here's an example of a live product in the market. Um, so on the blister pack, I think I have a, another sample here you could take a look at. Uh, on the blister pack, you have a scratch-off panel with a unique number to that blister, right? So each different blister has a different number. And then you scratch off the panel, you text it in, in the future you could actually even use a 2D barcode. Take a picture of the 2D barcode, so you don't have to do any scratching or texting. And then there's a serial number on the side to help with tracking the products in case some get lost and so on. We actually use that, I'll talk about that in a second. When you send a text message, here's the response you get. So it's designed to be very um, direct with the message I wanna get across. If you don't have time to read even a text message, which is sort of where we're heading with people's attention span these days, you just need to read the first line. First line says okay or it says fake, right? You could ignore everything else Right? But you know what you're essentially required to do if, if it says genuine or fake in the first line of the message. We also have a call center. So if you have a question or something, you just call it in and speak to a live human uh, who can help you out. And uh, growing over time as phones get fancier and people get more sophisticated with technology, you could use the web to verify products as well. And eventually we'll get to RFID where you could just tap the product with your phone and get a reading, so you don't have to do any of this stuff at all, but technology infrastructure isn't there uh, just yet. But we're ready for it. And so as these data points come in, we're able to pinpoint some of the hot spots of counterfeiting. So here's a map of Nigeria where the service is live, and the pins indicate sort of where the suspicious activity is. So if you're a law enforcement agent, in the past what you've had to do is sort of do random sampling. So you wake up one day, roll a dice, and say, ah, it feels good to be in this western part of the country today. You probably do something fancier, but effectively you have the same outcome that they go to a place and discover that, yeah, probably the counterfeiters aren't here today, they're somewhere else. So it's not a very smart way, if you don't have a whole bunch of money, uh, especially in these emerging markets, to find where the counterfeiters are. You want to do something like this, where you could see the hotspots called in by consumers, so you could send your SWAT team to go take out a pharmacy that's selling fake drugs on the fly while the fake drugs are still there before they get carted out based on sort of whoever's informing the counterfeiters that the police is coming around. So let's look at an actual example. Last year in November, uh, a manufacturer of a very popular anti malaria drug uh, experienced theft. Cargo theft happens in the pharmaceutical industry. Things magically fall off the truck and grow legs and walk away. Um, and nobody claims ownership for, for that. So they have 3,000 blisters stolen. And these are high value, uh, life saving drugs. Could have cured malaria in 3,000 uh, people. And it's about $10,000 of, of money uh, lost. And so what they did is they used the serial number, the overt number on the side that I showed you earlier on, to tell us which numbers, which range was missing. We changed the response, instead of saying, okay, genuine, to say, stolen product, make sure you get a receipt and call this number. 
Within three days, we're able to pinpoint the pharmacies that were selling the stolen products. The stolen product moves very fast, right? Those legs on the boxes actually uh, run quite quickly. And uh, the, the, the government was able to shut down uh, the pharmacies involved. We were able to go up the supply chain and discover the distributor that supplied the stolen products to the pharmacies. Sometimes pharmacists don't know they're getting suspicious product. Sometimes you could kind of question the ignorance, uh, but very often they're not trained as product security experts, you're trained as pharmacists. And so in the future we see having a separate layer of uh, scratch off technology so that the, phar the pharmacists themselves can check the products before they buy them and then hand those off to their patients so that they also get covered. And then so on, we go up the supply chain all the way to the manufacturer and perhaps even upstream because there are issues with the supply chain upstream as well. So does this stuff work? It works quite well. So here's where we've seen the most traction uh, worldwide with the solution. And this represents what's been done and what's coming up. Uh, so pharmaceutical is a big play Lots of fake pharmaceuticals are now being tagged. We've done tens of millions of these individual blisters. Uh, we've already seen over a million patients text in the, the, the codes on the products. We're beginning to see some interesting non-pharmaceutical uses as well. Uh, so we're now working with car part manufacturers. If you've been in a taxi ride in Hyderabad or Delhi, uh, it's terrifying enough with genuine brakes. Imagine being in there with <laughs> with fake brakes, and then you probably would, would get fitter and start walking or, or, or do something, you know, smart cities. Um, but uh, <laughs> but with, uh, with uh, pharmaceuticals and so on, we've seen expansion to agrochemicals. So imagine you're a farmer, and you got ripped off, and you bought these seeds that are supposed to be the fancy hybrids, but they're not. And then you plant them, and two weeks, one month later, you realize that you got no crops. Right? So you're not going to die due to some fake drug, you're probably going to experience economic hardship, which could lead to quite severe outcomes. So fake seeds, fake agrochemical inputs, fake fertilizer is a problem, especially in East Africa, that we're able to address with this technology. And sports, drinks, and shakes, and so on. Again, imagine the Olympics are coming up, you've trained all this time, and you took some milkshake thing or other to boost your performance, and then you realize it has some banned <laughs> substance in it. And so now you're disqualified and you go cry along for a long time. I mean, that's not a very happy story. So we help people avoid these outcomes using technology so they can verify the products and make sure that they're paying for what they think they're getting. What does this mean for you? Typically, technology that's developed in emerging markets is not a very common thing. Because right? typically technology goes from the developed world, as it's sort of getting old, it ends up in developing nations. But technology developed in developing emerging markets could one way make their way back into emerged or developed markets because it's faster to turn around uh, these things, especially in the pharmaceutical industry overseas because there's a little less regulation and so on. So we may see in the US the ability for patients to verify products before they take them. And why is that important? According to the WHO, when you hit those illegal websites and buy Viagra for 50 cents or whatever they're selling these days, online pharmacies that conceal their addresses and do not require prescriptions uh, tend to serve fake drugs 50% of the time. So you think you're getting a good deal and they're getting a good deal because they're selling you cornstarch with blue color and you think you're gonna get performance enhancements which really don't come. Uh, when you take the pills. So this is a, a pressing issue even for developed markets because of internet pharmacies. And if only you could have a way to tell when you're buying a drug from the internet at a good price that you are actually getting a genuine product. Thank you. Yeah.